Hi class, welcome to chapter 36. This chapter focuses on the study of populations and how populations can grow, um, grow and shrink, I should say, um, and what factors influence either that growth or um, um, decrease in population. So what causes populations to increase and what um, causes populations to decrease? So remember, let's do a quick review. Which of the levels listed below is the level at which biologists study how organisms of different species interact with each other? Remember that a population is all the rabbits, for example, in Florida Canyon. So we're talking about the group of a same species, um, the, the <laughs> sorry, the um, all the members of the same species within a geographic area that can interbreed and interact with one another. That's a population. But this question is asking how organisms of different species interact with one another. So for example, how um, what particular kinds of grass um, do the rabbits in Florida Canyon eat? Uh, what kind of animals prey on the rabbits and so on? This would be at the level of community. So we're looking at the community of uh, different populations that live and interact with one another in Florida Canyon. Population ecology is a field of science that um, uh, studies how populations can change in time and what factors regulate those changes in that population. A really nice example of this is the caribou herds in Alaska. If you look, there's lots and lots, I think there's at least a couple dozen, maybe even three dozen different herds of caribou that um, uh, migrate um, over time in different areas of Alaska and all of these populations. So we would consider this a population because they typically only interbreed with one another, um, even though sometimes they overlap. If we look, for example, at um, herd number 29 and herd number 26, for example, you can see that their ranges, the area over which they graze or you know, move um, overlaps a little bit. So there might be some small, you know, overlap in population, or maybe they interact with each other in some way, but chances are their migratory patterns keep them from interacting in any significant way. And population ecologists would then consider them distinct populations. So when we're looking at populations, we want to look at two things, the abundance, which is the overall number. So how many, and then how densely are they, um, spread out over a particular geographic area. In other words, the number of individuals of, of this particular species per unit area. So for example, if you look at San Diego, San Diego is very, and we were looking at humans in San Diego, we have a very sparsely populated area. So if we look at the size of San Diego, the geographic, like the square miles of San Diego, the footprint, there's very few people living here per square mile um, at comparing, compared um, to uh, pretty much any other U.S. <laughs> any other U.S. city. The the space here. There's very few um, high density living um, uh, buildings. You know, like uh, multi story apartments. There's very few duplexes, many single family homes, and so on. So we're really spread out given our area. So we could look at the city of San Diego in terms of the overall number. I want to say that there's like. I think there's between 1 and 1.5 million people here, and the population density of the city itself is really quite low. <clears throat> so when we look at populations, think to yourself and ask yourself, how can a population grow and how can a population decline? So it turns out that there's two ways that can, um, uh, two things that can influence each of these. Oops, sorry. So the way that a population can grow is through, of course, birth and immigration. However, a population can decrease in size, of course, by death. And the opposite of immigration, which is emigration. Right. Immigration means moving into emigration with an E means moving out of. So it's possible that, um, you know, um, a female caribou from herd number two becomes <laughs> smitten with a male caribou from herd number 29 and moves over to that herd. So she just immigrated to herd 29 and emigrated from herd number two. <clears throat> 
it's rare in these um, caribou populations that this can happen, but it can happen and that leads to an increase in one population and a decrease in the other. So there's four factors, births, immigrations, deaths, and emigrations that can affect a population size. So now ask yourself this question, which statement supports defining these herds as different populations? Okay, so um, again, ask yourself which one you think it is. So we can eliminate one, hopefully, as an obvious incorrect answer, and that is B. It doesn't matter whether they're herbivores or carnivores or so on. Um, what we're really looking at is how can we determine that these populations, all of these different one through, how many are there? 31, I was close, um, <laughs> about 30 different uh, caribou herds, how can we... Um, what data or what reasoning are we using to de determine that they're distinct herds? Well, A and C are actually both reasons that we would consider them the same herd. Like why aren't we just considering all of these herds that are in like all caribou that are in Alaska, why aren't we just considering them the same population? Well, um, you, you could, uh, the problem with that is that remember that the key um, defining feature of a population is that these animals will only um, interact with one another and breed with one another. So for example, this herd number 28 here, right, they're never going to interact with any, pretty much anything past this peninsula, right, this very long, I think this is the Aleutian Peninsula, I think it's called, um, right, they're, they're pretty much geographically isolated down here. Um, by probably some, um, there's some waterway that separates them or some mountain range or so on. So they're um, uh, fairly isolated from one another. So um, don't forget that um, caribou will also migrate with um, availability of both, um, there's plenty of water in Alaska, really the availability of food. So wh uh, where grass is plentiful and where they're um, grazing is best. So the way that these caribou migrate is going to limit their interactions with other herds. And so this is going to limit, of course, the mating patterns. And so population ecologists that study these caribou herds can see by looking at their DNA and their genetic, um, basically creating really elaborate family trees for these caribou herds, that they really have these distinct populations. And so, for example, as I mentioned before, herd number 29 and herd number 26, even though there is some overlap in their ranges, because they're there in those parts of the range at different times, they're not really going to interact with one another. And therefore they have, they're kind of becoming genetically distinct from one another. And we can consider them separate populations because they don't interbreed with one another. They don't, uh, of course, they obviously don't mate with one another and they don't interact with any um, one another in any significant way. All right, just a quick review. Which of these would cause the population to decline in size? So you can kind of think of this like a teeter-totter, right? You have kind of um, um, competing factors. If we have a high birth rate and a high death rate, our change isn't really going to happen. There's not going to be a very high de um, a very high um, rate of change either way because both birth rate and death rates are high. If we have um, a high, whoops, <laughs> you can erase that really quick. Whoops, wrong one. There we go. Okay, if we have a high birth rate and a high immigration rate, that's actually going to cause our population to increase, right? If we have lots of people moving to the area and high birth rates, we're going to, uh, or caribou for that, I guess we're talking about caribou, um, then uh, we're going to have that population increase in size. Low birth rates and high death rates. So that one sounds pretty promising, right? Because our birth rates are going to be low and our death rate is going to be high. So that's going to cause the population to decline. So that looks like a good candidate. And let's just look at D um, to eliminate it as well. Low birth rates and high immigration rates. So if we have a low birth rate, but high immigration rate, 
then that's actually going to cause the population to stabilize depending on the rates, right? If we, you know, relatively speaking, we don't know exactly where the birth rates are, the immigration rates are, but that's not necessarily going to significantly cause any kind of decline in population. So for this question, our answer is C. Okay, so this is a fun little experiment to actually try to mathematically model how populations can change over time. And so, um, believe it or not, barnacles are a really good animal, I shouldn't call them an animal, um, organism, I guess. Uh, um, I don't know if they're considered animals or not, they're filter feeders, I don't think they're animals, yeah. <laughs> um, um, not a marine biologist. Uh, barnacles are really good, they're a good model to use because they're stationary and therefore they're easy to count, they're in the intertidal zone, so we can, they, we can kind of get to them quite easily. They're not like, you know, deep underwater where we have to um, go through a lot of trouble to count them. Um, and so on. So let's just very quickly talk about the life cycle of barnacles. Um, barnacles um, begin their life as little tiny larvae called noclea, and they, they basically float in the water. And then at a certain stage in their life, they're going to attach themselves to a rock and continue their life cycle and eventually turn into a filter feeder that feeds on plankton. And because they are stationary, they're very easy to count. They don't move. We're not worried about... Um, um, them, you know, like trying moving while we're trying to count them and so on. <clears throat> so what could affect if we were to go down to Sunset Cliffs or um, what's the one down at the end of um, Point Loma? Um, oh, for goodness sake, the... Um... <laughs> I can't think of the nice... There's a beautiful park down at the very end of, um, of um, Point Loma. Um, Oh my goodness, I can't I can't think of it. It's not um it's not coming to me. Um, but anyway, there's lots of areas in San Diego um, where you can go and look at these intertidal zones that have these barnacles. And so if you were to look at these barnacles here on this rock, what could affect how many barnacles there are there or how many survive? So in other words, can you come up with at least three different things that can influence how many barnacles are going to either get on this rock, stay on this rock, grow on this rock, and so on? Pause the video and see how many you can come up with. Well, it turns out that there's lots. There's a lot of factors that can affect how these barnacles, um, the barnacle population either grows or shrinks, right? Increases or decreases. So for example, there can be parasites. In fact, there are parasites of barnacles in most filter feeders that can lower the population size. People can harvest them or walk on them. I know that when I go to... Um, um, the place that I can't think of the name of right now, I'm really surprised to see how many people walk through those tide pools because every time you walk, you're basically crushing something under your under your sandal. And so um, the amount of people that use that area could um, cause in, uh, probably a decrease in um, the number of barnacles that can stay on that rock. Things like pollution, global warming, right? If the temperature of the um, of the water gets too high, that could make an inhospitable environment for those barnacles. Um, of course, space is a big issue, right? The barnacles need a certain amount of space in order to grow and reproduce and so on. Th there's lots and lots of factors that can determine where, um, how and why that population either increases or decreases in size. So we're going to look at a rock and we're going to count the number of barnacles on that rock over time. So we're going to take uh, some rocks, they're empty, they're, in other words, there's no, um, there's no barnacles on them already. We're going to place it in an intertidal zone, so basically in a tidal pool. And then we're going to just, just to kind of keep this experiment a little bit more straightforward, uh, we're going to put a cage over this rock so that the, there's no predation that can occur. And we're going to um, count the number of barnacles that grow on this rock over a month long period. So what would you think would it would look like? So just sketch, sketch a little graph like this um, uh, on your sheet of paper and ask yourself what you think it would look like over a month. Would we get any barnacles? Would we get a lot of barnacles? There's no wrong answers here, right? You're just kind of guessing. Well, let's look at the data, right? Let's see what we actually get. Um, well, oh, okay, so before, sorry, I forgot about the slide. So before we do that, what does your graph look like? Is it a straight line? 
is it? Remember, and remember, we typically don't, um, uh, if you remember way back in the beginning of the semester, we usually plot data points, but because we are looking at the same population over time, we can actually connect those dots and draw a line. Because we're looking at the same population, right? We're looking at the same rock from April 1st all the way to April 30th. So we're looking at a, con a continuous data set, so we can draw a line here. So what does your line look like? If you were to connect all the dots on your graph, is it uh, basically a straight line? Does the line have some kind of curve attached to it? Is the line dynamic? Does it change over time? Let's look at the data. So if we, so here's the actual data. So we counted it on day one, day five, day 10, and so on over this month. And we counted the number of barnacles per square centimeter um, on, on this rock. So pause the video and try to um, plot this data for yourself and I'm gonna do the same. Okay, so hopefully your graph looks something like mine. And again, if we connect the dots, because we are talking about a continuous data set, we're going to see a line that looks like this. So which one is it? A, B, or C? Hopefully you can see now that it's very clearly C. And there, again, there's nothing wrong with um, guessing wrong and because you don't have any, you know, you don't have a hypothesis and you don't have a working model to start from. But it turns out that the growth pattern of barnacles on a rock and, and lots of other living things, by the way, um, often follows this kind of log scale growth, this, this growth that we see in, in um, graph number C. So here we can see um, the population. Um, it, so it initially, right? It increases. And then, oh, I think I have some, yeah, I have some animations here. So it initially increases at some rate. And then you can see that in a certain period of time, we have a really fast rate of growth. And at some point, it's going to reach what we're going to call carrying capacity. And this carrying capacity is the maximum size that a particular in environment can sustain. So in this case, we're looking at the rock and how many barnacles can actually fit on that rock. And we're not necessarily just talking about the size of the rock, like per, you know, we did, we counted the barnacles per square centimeter, but it could also be due to other, I mean, it's usually a space issue, especially for barnacles, because they need a place to um, attach and, um, and to kind of cement themselves and affix themselves too. But it could also be other factors like nutrient availability, right? They're competing with one another in a way for all of the plankton that's coming through and, um, and so on. So this is called carrying capacity. When we reach the maximum size that that, put, you know, in this case, a rock, the maximum si bar number of barnacles, we're gonna call that the carrying capacity. So it turns out that there are three kind of basic models that we can use to define the growth rate of a particular population. So when we're looking at how does that population um, grow, we can we, we define that as a rate. In other words, it's the rate of change of individuals, so the number of individuals in the population over time. Notice that our y-axis is number of individuals, the density of barnacles, and our x-axis is time. So if the rate grows in a steady fashion, right, so the same rate of growth over the entire month, we're going to call that a linear growth pattern because it creates a line. Now, on the other hand, we can have an exponential growth rate occur where basically the this is almost like the like an interest rate <laughs> kind of thing. It keeps speeding up and it gets faster and faster and faster. This is called an exponential growth curve. And we see this by this very characteristic. We call this like a hockey stick or a J curve. 
um, and it's called exponential growth. Most natural systems are going to adhere to what's called a logistic growth curve. In other words, they're going to grow exponent, right? If we were to look at this graph up until this point, it looks a lot like the exponential growth curve. So what happens here is this population is going to follow an exponential growth pattern until what? Until it hits the carrying capacity. So we have three different models, linear, exponential, and logistic. <clears throat> so ask yourself, the population growth rate or change in population density is doing what? Which of these is the correct answer for these three different models? So remember that here, what we're looking for is the rate. In other words, how, how fast, how fast is the population changing over time? It turns out that in the, um, let's see here, constant in increasing over time. So the population growth rate is increasing over time in all three growth curves, no, increasing over time. Hmm, constant, no. So we definitely know the growth rate is not constant over time because we can see that the growth rate changes in exponential versus logistic growth, constant in the linear growth curve, and changes over time in the, this is great, this is, I like this one. The correct answer here is, is D. So if we look at the change in number, so for example, in the first five days, The, uh, again, this isn't so some model, right? We got about, it looks like about, I don't know, maybe 16, right? It's a little over, it's almost to that 20, but I'd say about 16. At 10, we're at about 32. And at 20, we're at about 64 and so on. That growth is constant. In other words, there's no big difference in the curve of the the shape of the line of this graph whereas here if we look the growth rate here is hardly anything right the increase the population is not increasing very much at all so uh, again we're looking at the slope of this line the the oh goodness what is the slope of the line um m equals y over x no what is slope of the line <laughs> i forget my <coughs> i forget my algebra slope of a line. Um, so the line is what, what, what? I'm Googling it, Googling it on my phone really quick. It is M. So is it rise over? It's rise over run. Yeah. What the change in Y over the change in X, right? So we're looking at, sorry, let me clean this up a little bit here. The slope of the line is equal to the change in y over the change in x. In other words, how fast is y changing compared to how fast is x changing? Remember, y is our number of barnacles and x is our time. So you can see that it's not the, the slope of the line, in other words, the change is really constant in a linear graph. Let's look at what it does in an exponential graph. Let's look at the first five days. Is the population changing? No, right? It's hardly growing at all. We could probably even extend that out to 10 days. But look at what happens from 15 to 25 days. Look at what happened to the slope of the line. It dramatically increased, right? So the constant changes over time in the exponential growth model. How about the logistic growth model? Does that slope of the line change over time? Absolutely it does. In this case, it's actually changing in two different places, right? Here, slope of the line, not that much. Here, slope of the line, very dramatic. And then here, once we hit that carrying capacity, it levels off again. So we have these three different models and they all depend on how that growth rate changes over time. And in this, in this case, we're looking at 30 days, um, but this could be over years. In fact, I think I have, 
Um, but yeah, we have in a couple slides, we have some really nice models on how this works. So um, again, linear is constant. And so this usually is a model where we have very, hmm, how would I say, very small changes in a population over time. So we're looking at a population with very low biotic potential. In other words, a population that will not grow very fast. And I have a, um, an example of that here in just a minute. <clears throat> Whereas in an exponential graph, the population growth, um, I don't know if you can see this, let me just move this down just a bit. There we go. So the population growth rate in an exponential curve is always going to be, whoops, is always going to be increasing. However, in a logistic growth curve, it's going to increase, and then that population growth rate is going to decrease when we hit that carrying capacity. So all three of these are viable models for describing how a population could change over time. Let's look at some examples. So here we have a bristlecone pine. It's a very long-lived type of tree, and they have they they um, they grow extremely slow, and they very rarely grow new trees. These trees, I want to say, are hundreds, if maybe even thousands of years old. Let me Google this too. I want to bristle bristlecone pine. Long lived, highly resistant, harsh weather to harsh weather, bad soils. Uh, they're the one of the longest lived life forms on the planet. And where do they live? I want to say they live in um, like Nevada and, and Utah. They're very, they're trees that can survive in very inhospitable environments, but they do not reproduce very fast at all. So long lived species do not reproduce very much at all. Okay. Bacteria. What do we know about bacteria? How do bacteria reproduce? One bacteria divides into two. Two, each of those bacteria are gonna divide into two more, right? So in other words, the population is going to double and then double again and then double again. And it turns out bacteria have a fair amount of diversity in terms of how fast they double, but a bacteria like E. coli, for example, that's a pretty common bacteria that's in our gut. In ideal conditions, those bacteria will double about every 20 to 25 minutes. So you can imagine how fast that bacterial population can grow um, uh, in, you know, given over a month, let's say. Um, gray wolf, what do we know about the gray wolf in um, the United States anyway? Um, they are um, uh, just recently, actually I think in many states they're still on the endangered list. Some states very unfortunately are allowing hunting of the gray wolf but they were extirpated from many areas of the United States for a very long time, and they're very slowly being reintroduced. So where they are being reintroduced to um, um, a community, to an ecosystem or a habitat, um, they are in very low numbers. So just keep that in mind. And then finally, we have red fox. They're fairly common in many areas of the United States. Um, they're um, very how would I say, they are very dependent on local conditions for survival. So when times are good, their population explodes. They have, I think, two to four kits per, uh, per litter. Um, so when times are good, there's lots of rabbits, there's lots of water and so on. Uh, they can um, increase quite easily, but the opposite can happen as well. So let's look at how each of these different types of models can define these species. Remember that, let's look at the population. Um, well, first ask yourself, like try to, uh, so pause the video and try to describe what's happening in each of these by looking at the growth model. Again, remember, look at that X and Y axis and ask yourself which of the three models that we're using, linear, exponential, and logistic growth can, um, um, define uh, this population. So I think it's very important, one, to look at the scale of the X and Y axis. Notice that in um, some cases, we're looking at um, a period of time, so this is over a hundred years, 
And 100 years for a bristlecone pine is nothing. Again, they live for hundreds, I want to say even thousands. I meant to look this up. Bristlecone pine. The oldest pine, bristlecone pine known is over 5,000 years old. I just got that off of Wikipedia, so I'm not, don't, don't hold it against me. It's probably off just a little bit, but these things live for thousands and thousands of years, right? So 100 years is nothing uh, um, for these bristlecone pines. So as you can imagine, they're, and again, they're super tough, so they're not going to die. Uh, so they're, they're, um, their growth curve is really, non-existent there's there's really no growth because there's no birth and there's no death and they're not, they can't immigrate they can't immigrate or emigrate so their population is going to stay fairly stable over time over this and which is considered a short period of time for them 100 years now let's look at bacteria bacteria we're looking at a period of a day less than a day right 20 hours and then notice also our y-axis is the number of bacteria per microliter. A microliter of liquid is, like if you think of a drop of water, think about what, you know, when you picture in your mind a drop of water, a raindrop or something, that's about 50 microliters. So divide a raindrop by 50 and that's a microliter. <laughs> so we're talking about a really, really, really small little piece of, of water and we can get up to, it looks like six or 700 um, bacteria per microliter um, of media. So what happens to these bacteria? We put a very, very small amount of bacteria in uh, the flask at time zero. And within, um, it looks like within two hours, right, we're going to enter that crazy rate of growth, right? Look at the slope of that line. And then what happens here? What are we calling this limit? Remember, that's our carrying capacity. Because what's happening here is the bacteria using up all of the nutrients, right? All they have to eat is whatever is in that media. And as soon as all of the nutrients in that media start to run out and they start to bump into one another and it gets crowded, they're not going to be able to um, divide as quickly or survive. Let me turn this off really quick. Swipe down. Swipe down. Turn off. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, so we see, again, so this would be linear. This would be logistic because we see that population hitting its carrying capacity. And now let's look at what's happening with the wolf because this is very, uh, very interesting. Notice the time. This is crucial, right? We have a period of time, it looks like in the mid 80s, and we're looking at it until about 2010. So it turns out that in the mid 80s, early, depending on what area of the country you're looking at, this is when wolves were reintroduced. In fact, next week we're gonna look, watch a video um, on reintroducing wolves to Yellowstone and how that affected the ecosystem of, of Yellowstone. So because there was such a small number of wolves, again, look at our, look at our Y axis, right? We started with basically zero wolves in most parts of this country. And um, because we started with zero wolves only 20 years ago, and wolves are similar, um, goodness, I'm trying to think, for a wolf pup to make it to sexual maturity is, is pretty rare. Uh, wolves don't reproduce very often. They usually only have one or two pups when they do. So their reproductive capacity isn't very high, right? They're not like rabbits or, you know, frogs or, or whoever that just, you know, have lots and lots of babies. Wolves don't create a lot of babies and they certainly have a really difficult time surviving as well. So when we talk about the wolf population in America and modeling it, they are still in kind of this early phase of, oh, they're almost like pioneers right now. They're, 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 they have lots and lots of prey species because um, they're really the only predator around. This is a big issue in Wisconsin uh, right now because um, there's too many deer in Wisconsin. And so the wolves have all the food they could possibly want. And so their numbers are growing really fast, but they haven't reached that carrying capacity yet. Notice that there's no there's no tail off in, in that, um, in that growth curve. It'll happen. It will happen at some point. There's going, they're just going to get too many and we'll see that, um, growth curve bump into the carrying capacity, but we just haven't seen it yet. So, um, if we were to get the rest of the data through 2020, we would probably see these numbers start to level off. So this would be exponential. 
And again, the only reason this is exponential is because we're looking at a really short period of time. We're basically looking at about 20 years. Now, if we were to look at the wolf, our last, or the wolf, uh, red fox, sorry, the fox um, uh, from 1972 to 1992, so again, 20 years, what we see here is none of the three, right? This is not necessarily anything that we've seen before, and so we're, we can't define this in the three, um, as one of the three linear exponential or logistic growth models, because what really happens with red fox populations and populations of animals that depend, very much depend on the environment that they're in, the health of the environment, is that you see these um, kind of boom and bust cycles, because um, as the, say, their main source of food, which is probably rabbits and, ro and other rodents, when they go down, the, the fox population is going to go up, go down. And then when they go up, the fox population will go up and so on. So what we're seeing here is the availability of resources over time. One of these summers maybe was a really bad drought. And so there was hardly any water and therefore many of the rabbits died. And so the foxes didn't have a major food source and so on. So we see this with lots and lots of um, kind of um, um, primary, what would they, primary... Um, we're going to talk about this in chapter 36, um, or I'm sorry, chapter 37, the primary consumers, I think they're called. Oh, so I just talked about this. What do we think uh, the reason for this exponential growth that we see in, uh, in, in wolf populations right now? So hopefully you can see right away that we can eliminate D, right? Wolves don't mutate to grow faster. Remember that there is no purpose to mutations. They don't simply mutate to an, you know, to an end purpose or an end goal. So we know right away that's wrong. Hopefully you recognize from what I said before that wolves do not have a high biotic potential. They do not have lots and lots of offspring. So uh, we know that if they, when they do have increases in population through birth, that increases that increase is very low. They don't have, again, lots and lots of offspring. Wolves are not a new species, right? They've been here for thousands and thousands of years, way before um, uh, people were here, certainly. And um, uh, it was only with colonization, really, by Europeans that these wolf populations plummeted, right? This is um, a very recent... Um, uh, a very recent thing because uh, basically a lot of the um, Europeans that came here had a very, a very to, to put it simply, they had a very messed up view of how nature works. They didn't understand um, the um, the role that predators play in a um, in an ecosystem, and they just thought that wolves were bad because they thought that wolves kill their cows and their sheep and their livestock, and so we should get rid of wolves. And they basically eradicated them from the United States. Um, in fact, here in the Southwest, there's a Mexican gray wolf, and I think there's only it's a it's a functionally extinct population of wolf uh, because the U.S. Forest Service eradicated them that was there it was literally some people's jobs to shoot wolves on site um and they got um a certain number a certain amount of money per pelt that they turned in uh so i think there's only like seven i feel there's 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 less than 20 mexican gray wolves left period so it's really uh really unfortunate so the reason that wolf populations are rebounding um, in the United States is because they were extirpated. Again, they were their, their population was basically brought down to zero. And they have, in some cases, they were reintroduced by people. So for example, in Yellowstone, uh, conservation biologists actually introduced a, um, um, a pack of wolves to Yellowstone uh, to repopulate Yellowstone with wolves. In Minnesota and Wisconsin, they actually came um, back to that area from Canada. So in some cases, they were reintroduced by people. In other cases, they immigrated back into the area um, from other areas. So this is so the main reason that we still see this kind of um, exponential growth. Again, this is not very recent data uh, is because the wolf population was so low for so long. Okay, so this is just kind of a mathematical explanation of what we've been talking about. So if you've taken um, if you've taken um, calculus, you'll understand a derivative. So basically, that little d stands for change. So we're looking at the change in. So n is going to be the number, right? So n 
is our number. In other words, the population. And T, of course, is time. So we're looking at the change in population compared to the change in time. Right? So if that's not changing, we have a linear growth model. If it's changing, if it's increasing, in other words, if the rate of change is increasing, we're going to get exponential. <clears throat> if the change of the population, so the change in population, the change in number, compared to the change of time increases and then decreases, we're going to get a logistic growth curve. And if there's not a <laughs> other, <laughs> if there's not a mathematical mo model that we can apply that's either linear, exponential, or logistic, we would apply, we would basically say this is other. And again, a perfect example of this is red fox populations, whose populations essentially go through a boom and bust cycle with the availability of prey animals and environmental conditions. So uh, this is, and this is, uh, the classic example of this is the hare and the lynx. So the main, um, if you look at um, um, Arctic kind of, it, it, the colder, well, I shouldn't say that. There's other um, examples of this. But if we go into very cold regions, the taiga, the tundra, and the Arctic regions, those biomes that you learned about in Chapter 34, the food webs and the way that inter um, the animals interact with one another is very linear. The hare, the snowshoe hare, for example, is really the only, is the main prey species for a lynx. A lynx, if it can't get rabbit, it can't just change to something else. There's not, there's not much else there because it's such an inhospitable environment that not many things can survive there. So what happens is when that snowshoe hare population, the black line goes down, we can be sure that the lynx population is going to go down as well. Many of the lynx simply starve to death. Um, what also happens is the lynx don't have viable pregnancies or their pups die very, or I guess it would be their kits, right? Their kits die quite young because they simply don't have food. And so when there's lots of snowshoe hares around, the lynx population will go back up because they have plenty to eat, they have nutrients, they can feed their young, and so on. So we see these boom and bust cycles. So the lynx, very similar to the, the red fox that we saw um, in our example earlier. So when we're talking about gr uh, population growth, we can talk about two different ways of, two different categories of factors that can influence that growth. So one way is through density dependent factors. So these are factors that depend on the size or the rate of growth of a population or the population density. This almost always has to do with intraspecific intra competition. Remember that intra means within. So within species. So in other words, all of the lynxes, right, the lynxes have to compete with one another to get the snowshoe hares, right? So this is an intra-species competition because they're fighting for food sources, right? The fastest lynx, for example, or the sneakiest one will get um, uh, food to eat, whereas the other ones will not. They're competing for food. Another example of an intraspecies competition would be availability of nesting sites. Um, that's a, this is a big issue for birds, especially as um, bird habitat gets smaller and smaller. Um, believe it or not, everyone thinks that birds nest in trees, and that's really not true. Only a, a kind of a pretty small percentage of birds actually nest in trees. Most birds nest on the ground or in shrubs just a couple feet off the ground. And so as those nesting sites go away, the birds have to compete with one another for territory to nest in. And this is a, this is a density dependent um, type of competition. So think about the wolves right now, right? If you're a wolf and you uh, were in Canada and you're like, I'm gonna bounce, I'm going to Wisconsin, and you go down to Wisconsin, you're the only wolf there, right? You have no competition with, you also don't have a boyfriend, I guess. <laughs> Um, I guess that can be not so great, uh, but you're not competing with other wolves for a deer, right? Uh, the one thing that wolves do not have a problem with in, in Minnesota and Wisconsin right now is availability of, of food. There's so many deer and there's so many prey species there for them to eat that they, they don't, there's basically no density dependent factors that are influencing their population growth. 
On the other hand, we have density independent factors. So these are factors that it has nothing to do with the size. So for example, if there's a forest fire that wipes out, um, I know many of the cougars, for example, that were mountain lions, I should say, that were in the LA area were killed in last year's campfire. I think it was called the campfire. The one that was really fast. It moved through, um, what was it, like Malibu and the northern Santa Barbara and that, those areas. It killed a lot of the mountain lions there. And that has nothing to do with how densely populated the mountain lions are. They just had the really bad luck to be in a fire or in a forest where a fire swept through it. So density dependent versus density independent factors. Okay, I'm gonna pause the video here um, and end the first part uh, because we basically use the first part to talk about how we study populations of animals in um, the environment. And the second part of this um, talk is going to be how we study ourselves, how, we, um, how our population is growing and what factors may influence the, the growth of our own populations.